part of our conversations of change series would like to focus on how we can help the climate ecosystem being a human resources organization so climate asia is a non-profit dedicated to strengthening the climate ecosystem in asia through capacity building of organization focusing on human resources organizational development and thought leadership since climate change will cause a massive shift in functioning of several industry this initiative has been brought to bridge the gap in terms of organizations in the direct and the indirect space in terms of actors that work in the organization uh, in the sector uh, so we intend to accomplish this by building a platform that will help job seekers find climate jobs funders finding uh, organizations to fund and vice versa events news and thought leadership in terms of convenings conferences panel dis discussions and dialogue climate asia endeavors to create conversations around three pillars which is mainly share empower and connect by increasing awareness upskilling the ecosystem and networking we have launched this initiative which is a video series centered around the most pertinent of our crisis which is climate change uh to begin with today we have mr sanit de silva vijaya ratna the director and ceo of the climate and conservation consortium in sri lanka formerly known as the carbon consulting company the company is one of the region's premier providers of integrated environmental sustainability solutions to the corporate market with services such as carbon and water footprinting carbon asset management biodiversity assessment life cycle analysis etc sanath is also the co-founder and managing director of a digital marketing and design thinking company known as alter experience outside of work he likes to spend time outdoors in nature and enjoys music as well as performing as a part of a theater company okay thank you for joining and i begin by asking you um sir could you please uh, describe the work that you do at the climate and conservation consortium and what your role as the director such ceo looks like sure um so thank you very much for inviting me over and for having me uh it's great to be part of these conversations for change so um we started this company um i think just 12 years ago now uh and the purpose behind it uh and we identify ourselves as a profit for a purpose company was really to uh, be a catalyst for change uh we wanted to help bring about change in these corporate uh, environments that we worked in um we saw a lot of companies um, not really understanding the impact they create and even when they uh did have some understanding were not sure what they could do about it or how to manage it so we were really created our, co our founders got together to create a company that would inspire change that would be a catalyst for change so that we could bring these conversations into the boardrooms um so we started to focus on carbon emissions as our core area because we felt that that was where we could do the most um good Uh, and we were known for the last 11 years as the carbon consulting company uh we now we are going through a process of change ourselves we are broadening our, our sort of uh, outlook and uh, we are looking at uh, working within a greater geographical location uh, so and we also realized that we wanted to do a lot more for conservation uh, and and for some of the bigger picture climate issues so we now rebranded ourselves as climate and conservation consortium uh ccc is still a sort of acronym um but we our, our mission still is the same we want to be a, an engine for change uh and for the, and we are focused on corporates we want to help them become greener and cleaner um and and that's really what what the company is here to do um i think my role as uh the director and ceo is uh, the, there are multitudes of things i have to do uh primarily i think it's to drive the sort of strategic vision and direction for the company so that 
uh, we travel along a path that our, our board of directors and shareholders uh, envisioned when they created this company. Because as I said, we are a profit for a purpose company. Uh, we define ourselves by the nature of the good we have achieved rather than the financial return. So I think broadly speaking, uh, overview of the strategic direction. Um, and, on, and of course, on, on a day-to-day -day basis, I lead the client engagement function for uh, many of our larger uh, global clients, as well as uh, I provide input on sustainability strategy for them as well. So I think broadly speaking, those are the most important functions that I would do. Of course, day-to-day -day responsibility for the finances of the company and the financial performance and uh, all those are there as well. But the other things are, I think, what what's core to the role. Uh, that's really good to hear that you put purpose before profit, unlike a lot of organizations these days. And uh, given that you have a background in management as well as corporate law, how did you translate that into the climate action sector since you also work in strategy for your firm? And what would you say the key learnings were for you in, during this transition? Um, I think for me, um, because before I joined uh, this company, I'd spent um, over a decade in marketing communications. And, and, and at the time I left, I was overseeing uh, strategic planning and marketing strategy for uh, the agencies that I worked in, uh, as well as our clients. Um, I think for me, the learning was really how to take the disciplines that we had used from a branding, marketing, and communications uh, point of view for, for companies, right? And use those same um, methods, uh, models, to, you, to create business value from sustainability. And I think that that's the heart of, uh, you know, what little success we have achieved uh, over the last, you know, 12 years was that, I think the ability to take the, the business learnings um, from a management point of view and from a marketing point of view, uh, take those and adapt them to deliver business value from a sustainability point of view. So I think um, why we we had the, you know, why we have, we've been around for 12 years, which is great for, for such a you know, company as us. I think the reason is that we were able to translate business value out of what we brought to the client. So we were not really just talking to them about um, doing the right thing from an environmental point of view. We, we did that, but we were also able to couple that with business outcomes. And I think that's the reason that many clients still continue to work with us and choose us. So, um, I, I I didn't come from a sustainability background. I, I in fact uh, before I joined, I had I had heard of the term carbon footprint. I, I didn't know what it was or how to calculate it. But of course, we had some very smart people in the company. I know engineers, technicians, scientists, forestry specialists. So they knew how to do it. I think the value that I could bring to the table was to bridge the gap between business and sustainability and bring them together in a form that was a win-win situation for everybody. So and. And I think that's that's what worked for us. Uh, yeah, thank you for sharing that. And it's really important to bridge the gap when you're working in a purpose-driven mission. And given that your organization has now spent over a decade in this space and you also along with the organization, how what would you give as an advice to organizations that are just starting out in the space, as well as senior to mid-level professionals who want to transition into the space and entry-level professionals who want to enter the space, I mean. Okay. Um, I think that the advice that I've given common to all three um, would be firstly, don't be in a hurry. Um, especially the younger generation today, you know, Instagram, TikTok, it's kind of all uh, instant gratification. Um, in this space, I don't think that works. 
um, when I joined, when I it took when I sort of started with the company, it took us about six months to understand why what we wanted to do originally was not working, and then it took me another six months to really work around and transform the business, uh, the the approach of the business and the way we did our uh, calculations and what we brought to the table. So we had to really tweak it and work with it and and learn and transform. That doesn't happen overnight. Uh, so there was a lot of learning that went into it. And it took us a year to then really understand what we needed to do. And then another year to kind of really start putting our head up over, you know, head up over water kind of. Um, so if anybody's, you know, getting into it for the short term and saying quick returns and, you know, uh, we, we, we do something and we want to see the impacts and effects immediately, I would say you're in the wrong business. Uh, this is, I think, about the long game. Uh, this is about under because the very nature of climate change is really we are looking at something today in order to better the lives of uh, perhaps our grandchildren, not even our children. Yeah, I mean, children as well, but definitely our grandchildren. So we really have to take a long term view of everything we do. So, from why the company is formed, so companies wanting to go into this. Uh, I think need to go into it for the proper reasons. Um, this is not an area where you should come into it for the sake of making a buck. You know, uh, there are other things you can do to give a financial return to your shareholders. You shouldn't be in this space unless you really want to make a difference. I think our company is blessed with uh, a board of directors and, 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 share, and they are the shareholders of the company uh, that definitely put our purpose uh, before profit, and it's not that we don't make a profit. Uh, we, you know, we we are not a charity. We have to pay salaries, and we have our costs that we have to create. So I, I am tasked with that. But our company is uh, evaluated by the board on how far we have gone towards meeting our purposes. And and one of the reasons that we rebranded ourselves in, in this year was that the board said, let's expand our purpose. You know, we've done quite well over the last 10 years. What more can we do? Uh, and we are now in the process of, you know, transitioning into that bigger, larger kind of vision. Um, we are moving our headquarters to uh, do, uh, the United Arab Emirates in Dubai because we feel we can reach a greater geographic location from there. Uh, so all this is part of the the change process that's that's going on. Um, for the younger uh, new newcomers, I uh, I would say this is there's a uh, there's a lot of potential in this area if you're passionate about it and, and you need to be passionate about it because again if you're not if you don't have the passion for environment or, or sustainability you shouldn't be in the space. Uh, for the mid career individuals uh, who you know are considering perhaps making a transition. Um, I'm saying, you know, give it a shot because this, that's the same decision I was faced with where uh, it's, why don't you take a risk and try to see whether you can achieve something rather than step back and say, well, I'm, I'm an accountant, I'm something. I, I, as you very rightly said, I, I started my career as a corporate lawyer. Um, you know, right now I go around the, the globe <laughs> making speeches on, on, on climate change and environment. Nothing in my 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 education or my training uh, is relevant to what I'm doing now. Uh, so it's never too late to make a change. I think uh, you know keeping keeping a theme of you know making changes. I don't think it's uh, too late to make a change, even at mid career, even at senior level. Uh, take a change. You know, uh, it's good for you, and if you can achieve something great for the planet, it's a win-win situation. That's really good advice for especially people trying to transitioning to work in purpose driven organizations and uh, your organization works in primarily carbon and water footprinting carbon asset management biodiversity assessments and life cycle analysis for the corporate sector, what do you need to do to attract the right talent. And what are the skill sets that are required to work in these areas? And what are the challenges you face, if any? Okay, so let me start with your second question first. Um, what are the skill sets you require? Um, corporate sustainability is a broad area. 
Um, there are so many sort of sub disciplines that are relevant. Um, primarily, we work with um, engineers. So there can be uh, environmental engineers, chemical and process engineers, uh, sometimes mechanical engineers who kind of understand the, the way uh, production processes and manufacturing processes work. Uh, we have an energy specialist in our team. So we do offer energy uh, consultation as part of our work. But so at the core, we have engineers who are, who are doing the, the real nuts and bolts side of it. Uh, we have uh, forestry specialists who work on forest-based carbon reduction, uh, biodiversity. Uh, they work on water and uh, some of the way uh, we can reduce our water footprint. So they come from a, essentially a science, scientific background, uh, uh, environmental management, uh, forestry, uh, natural sciences. Uh, so that's that side is work. Uh, so these kinds of skill sets form one side of it. But there is another side, which is essentially the project management angle, uh, client engagement, uh, account management, project uh, delivery, uh, there's a lot of reporting, writing. So people with language skills, presentation skills, they are also necessary. And I think the great part of the team here at CCC is we have a, we have a bunch of people who, we have scientists, we have engineers, we have uh, client servicing and client engagement specialists. We have marketing people. Uh, so all these people have to come together, you know, if you're really going to make a difference. So there's a lot of potential for a lot of people. Uh, we, um, you mentioned in, in your introduction that I'm the managing director of a digital company called Altered Experience. The reason we co-founded, my, my other board members and I, we co-founded that uh, sort of separate organization was we saw an opportunity for uh, somebody who does digital uh, media and communication, but who also understands the sustainability space. Because we found that people doing communications didn't understand sustainability, people doing sustainability didn't understand communication. So we had to bring those parties together. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of opportunities in this space. Um, how do we retain, how do we attract and retain talent? I, I think we face the same challenges that, you know, employers everywhere uh, come, uh, come to face because, uh, I mean, if you run an ad saying, you know, we want this kind of person, you'll get 500 different applications, 490 of which are not relevant to, to that job. Uh, you ask for five years postgraduate experience, and we'd, we'd find second year university people applying for the job. You know, so those challenges are there. Uh, I think um, trying to attract the right people is is uh, really about creating an organizational culture, uh, a way of working, uh, an identity that the individual sees. Uh, as being linked to their own, you know, they, they feel like they want to be a part of that team. Uh, uh, you know, we, we created a whole team culture here an organization that people said, look, we, we like, we, we like it here. We want to be part of this. And then that gets out into the marketplace. And then other people say, we've heard about this. Can we join? Uh, and I think that's probably what we've done, uh, you know, in the, in the last couple of years, we in the pandemic we transitioned to working from home before anybody else really went into that. Uh, you know we are we offer people now flexi flexi hours. They can come into work when they want to. They can work from home when they want to. So all these things are done to really foster that uh, identity and the way we work, so that people can uh, relate uh, to you as an organization, you as a team, and when they want to be a part of it. Uh, I think that's when you've done it well. When people come to you and say, listen, we really want to be a part of what you're doing here and what you're creating, not just for the work, but the rest of the culture as well. Uh, and I think we've been lucky that we, we've done well. Um, the challenges of bringing people together is 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 tricky. I mean, um, over the last so many years, I, I used to think that this was a problem with my company until I started talking to other CEOs and so on and so forth. Um, if you if you list four people for an interview, uh, one of them doesn't show up. One of them will call that morning and say, I I'm sorry, I I've got another job, I'm not coming. 
Uh, one of them will come for the interview, but say, well, I'm not interested anymore. I want to do something different or, or something to that. And one will come for an interview. And these are people who the day before had confirmed that they were coming for an interview. Uh, and it's amazing. And I and we, we started doing this in Sri Lanka, and this was the case. We started recruiting people in Dubai. We found that it was still the case. Uh, you know, you have 150 applicants, you shortlist, you go through every single one, you spend so much of time. I do it personally. We, we shortlist people. We reach out to them and confirm an interview, and most of them don't show up, I mean, even virtually. So that's a huge challenge, and I, I really don't understand why that is. But uh, I've spoken to many companies, and they seem to face the same thing as well. Uh, yeah, that's something that we at Arthana, uh, our Climate Asia, are also familiar with since our primary drive is human resources management and not management but hiring and training and so completely agree with you on that and um, since you have your company has worked so extensively in emissions accounting ghg accounting to be precise product carbon footprints uh, life cycle analysis for your clients what would you say is the biggest challenge for companies to reduce their emissions? Um, and I've said this often, the biggest challenge is changing the way they think. Um, most companies, when we talk to them, want to continue doing business the same way. They want to continue to make same profits. They want to increase their profits. Uh, and they look to you and say, but you know what, fix our environmental side. Just, just give us some report that says we are, we are fine. We're not really interested in changing. We just want you to certify us. And um, as a company, we don't do that. Um, we need to convince uh, the decision makers, the CEOs, the directors, uh, that they have to fundamentally change the way they do business. And when they do that, it would necessarily mean incurring a cost, adjusting a process, uh, maybe not growing your business by the same amount that you expected it to go, maybe by 1% less. Uh, it's not that you, you will turn unprofitable, but you know maybe a little less than you would have done normally. Uh, you know, some, things like that um, require us to really spend a lot of our time engaging in this uh, mental change. Uh, the questions that we are being asked are still the wrong ones. Uh, it's still what's in it for me? How can we benefit as a company? How can I make more money? If I if I go with what you're saying, do I get more money out of this? Does my company, does my return to shareholders increase? Um, and that, that mental shift of saying, listen, we have to make money, but we also have to look after the planet and you know ensure that we are we are setting up ourselves for a long, long lasting relationship with the planet rather than when it's going to be dead and gone in 20, you know, 50 years or something like that. So I think that is the biggest challenge. Um, the, the, I think the biggest success we have uh, had is with family owned companies. Uh, you know, people who inherit a company, second, third generation, or who's, because these organizations more often than not see them, themselves having a duty to give back to their communities, to their staff, to their localities, and to the environment. So it is easier for them to understand that you know, they can give back to the environment uh, while running a successful business. Whereas the you know, traditional blue chip shareholder focused company doesn't see that they're too focused on shareholder return and dividends and profits. Uh, they will do a lot of activities, but they will do it for the sake of marking a tick box and not really doing something that is material to the size of an organization. Uh, so I think that's the biggest challenge we have. And um, get on top of that, how do you, uh, I mean, we all heard about H&M and how it was penalized in the UK for greenwashing. And how do you deal with the challenge of greenwashing if big companies who have so much money also do it? Then how do you do deal with that? Um, so we've been encountering greenwashing during the entire course of our, our lives. Uh, many times we've been asked to essentially facilitate greenwashing. 
uh, I've, I've been approached uh, by very large, very prestigious companies to say, listen, we just want you to give us some kind of certificate, uh, give you a $500 as a fee, just sign off something that says I'm, I'm green. Uh, and and I'm, I'm, I continue to be shocked at the nature of some of those requests and the companies that they represent. So I think the first step towards avoiding that is for people like us who endorse uh, environmental metrics and you know uh, working towards preserving the environment. We have to take a stand that we will not be part of this. Even if it costs us money uh, and business, we have to first say, we're not going to do that. And, and very early on, uh, I was faced with, I think in my first or second year, we were faced with a dilemma where, uh, you know, this potentially would be our second biggest client. He came up and said, well, I want you to sign off on something. I'm not willing to pay more than this. I want you to do this. And, and I said, I'm sorry, I'm not going to do that. Uh, it cost us a lot of money because he went to a competitor who blindly agreed to do whatever he wanted and just sign off whatever he did. Uh, many millions were lost and I had to go back to the board and say, I'm really sorry, but we can't do this. And I am very fortunate to have, as I said, a board of directors who shares that vision that says, no, that's not what we are here to do. I think that's the first step. The second step is for, I think, especially the largest companies. You, you mentioned h and the, the big company. Uh, worldwide, there are some really, really big companies now that's being, that are being called out for green motion. They need to start changing their mindsets as well. Uh, the easiest way to avoid greenwashing is to get impartial third-party validation of whatever your claims are. If you're saying you're this or that, get somebody who's uh, an expert in that area, who's outside, who's a, a certifier, a verifier, a consultant, to reinforce what you're saying. It says, look, I have independently looked at these claims and and I am, I'm I'm adding my name to that to say no they, what they're saying is right I think that's the easiest fix to have a complete and there are many certification verification options for greenhouse gas and carbon and environmental management and water and so many things uh, there they are available anybody can get them if needed you know so that for me is the biggest um, tool that we can deploy against greenwashing. But there is still a third option, and that's for consumers to kind of really rise up against companies that are doing this. Um, because today with social media, consumers have a lot more power in their hands. And when masses of consumers move towards something, the companies are forced to change. So in that, there's a big role for consumers to play, saying, no, we're not going to tolerate this. Anymore. We want to hold you accountable. You're saying this product is like this. I'm going to hold you responsible. I won't purchase. I won't participate. I won't share unless I'm you know, convinced, therefore. So I think there's a role that consumers have to play as well. Right. Thank you for sharing uh, that. And uh, you spoke about working uh, for profit, but with a purpose. And since that's your organization's overall vision, could you please share what your long-term vision is in the next 10 to 15 years in terms of contribution towards the climate action space in Asia and any other avenues you are thinking of expanding to? Um, so as I mentioned before, we kind of rebranded ourselves as climate and conservation because we wanted to expand our outlook. We want to get involved with more uh, conservation activities. We've been supporting in an in a advisory consultative role uh, conservation through of mangroves in uh, Myanmar and other plantations in Laos and a project in Sri Lanka. We have a bio, uh, bio link corridor for rainforest here in Sri Lanka. So we've been doing it, but we felt we can try to facilitate bigger action across the globe. Uh, the second one is that uh, in terms of climate, we want to start addressing other aspects of climate change and environmental impacts that um, we we were involved with, but we didn't really push because you know we were very much involved in the carbon space. Uh, one of these is is plastics. Um, I think about four years ago, um, we kind of helped certify uh, the first plastic neutral 
tea product. And we did that by assessing the plastic that went into the packaging in the process and so on and so forth. We used a life cycle methodology and it was ahead of the game so much so that one of the world standards who was writing a plastic standard for plastic credits reached out to us and said, would you share what you've done? And we said, of course, here, here's everything we've done and we'll be very transparent because we are here to help. And one of my team members was then requested to sit on their advisory body for the, you know, the body that was writing the standard for car, uh, plastic credits. Uh, so we will be looking at plastic, uh, hopefully in a big way. We are also going to start really looking at water. Uh, we created the world's first water neutral apparel factory some years ago. Uh, we learned how to do it the hard way, uh, but we know what we are doing now, we, but we haven't pushed it as a, as a driver. We, we want to do that, and you know, especially in, in places like the Middle East, where water is something that we need to look after. Uh, so we, uh, I think you know, water, plastics, um, and possibly even biodiversity to an extent is something that we, we want to get involved with. Uh, but the, uh, the main... Uh, I would say the main difference that we, we see ourselves uh, doing going forward is to help companies map out their sustainability strategy. You know, over the last seven, eight years, we've been working to help them measure their carbon emissions and help them set out a management plan going over a couple of years. And we, we did that because if we didn't do that, they wouldn't really do it. So we kind of handheld them throughout a multi-year process. But more and more, we began to realize that companies, many companies, didn't really have sustainability as part of their overall corporate strategy. Uh, and at some point of time, we kind of said, okay, we, we are going to have to do this. Otherwise, we are just going to be another little, little activity that they try to do during the year. So right now, we've been working with um, five or six clients at this point of time. Uh, and they, they're from manufacturing, uh, one is a large bank, um, and so on and so forth, to really capture uh, a sustainability essence of the company, map out uh, a complete sustainability roadmap and strategy over the next couple of years. And, you know, from board of directors, CEOs downwards, we bring everybody around the table, get a buy-in from that. And we believe that's how best we can uh, affect change in the companies to get them to really buy in incorporate sustainability strategy as part of what they're doing. So it just goes back to your one of your first questions about taking a business discipline uh, and adapting that into a sustainability point of view. You know, so we, when we do this, it then sustainability doesn't become just an annual thing that should we do this this year or should we do that? You know, you know, it, it's not an alternative that every year we have to convince companies to do. It's built into the company's DNA, uh, then it's much easier for them to use it as a day-to-day stuff. And I think that's where we are going now. Uh, that's very true that that works the best when you work with a company to develop their own capacities. And another thing that we wanted to know is what with you work in Asia in Right now, you mentioned you're working in Dubai also and Laos also. Are there any other areas other than Sri Lanka, Laos, and Dubai that you've worked at? Uh, I mean, we have we have a couple of clients in the UK, a uh, couple in Sweden, uh, one in Thailand, one in um, I've lost track to be very honest. Uh, we have we have some projects in Oman, uh, India. Uh, we've done some work in the Maldives. Uh, so. We've been kind of working uh, in the South Asian region. We've been expanding to the Middle East. We've also started working in Europe uh, with some of, the, some of the clients we have there, which is one of the reasons we are moving to the Middle East because uh, that's a more centric location to you know manage Europe as possibly as well as the Middle East uh, and South Asia. Of course, our, our core team will continue to sit in Sri Lanka and work out of South Asia, but we see ourselves being able to um, expand our role, you know, offer a greater geographic variety of uh, clients, our services, if we were to base ourselves in the Middle East, and that's one of the things we are going to do uh, going forward. Okay. So with that, we come to the end of our questions, and thank you for sharing in such detail.